Thanks for joining the Abide YouTube channel. For more information about Abide, go to AbideChurchFL.com and enjoy today's message. Good morning, family. How you guys doing? Are you alive? You're a little sleepy. Let's wake up this morning. Hey, we, we missed you guys last week. We were up in Virginia um, at a conference with Awaken the Dawn. They did one of their national conferences. So thank you guys for allowing us to go. But in the midst of that, we were watching online and watching God meet you guys in a significant way. How many of you guys were here last Sunday? Where God, how many of you enjoyed last Sunday? Ah, we had major FOMO watching it online. Where, where God came in. And what we want to do is um, we want to kind of process and talk about how do we respond when God moves and give language, context, and permission. How many of you know it's important to understand? Like God, is, God wants us to understand. How many of you know not all things that God does can be understood? Are you alive? I need you to talk back to me because I'm sitting. I need some affirmation. But, but for us as a people, we want to be able to allow questions to be asked and to be able to give understanding so that we can go with confidence and a full heart into all that God has for us. Now, how many of you know God has something for us? God has so much for us that I believe the Bible talks about things that I has not seen, ear has not heard, right? Places where God wants to take us. So we want to take just a little bit of time this morning and process how we respond. And I want to give you kind of what we're after in the very beginning of the message this morning. We want to take our time. But I recognize that many of you have been in church for many years. And I also recognize that not everything that happens in churches is good. Amen? And in the midst of us pursuing God, sometimes we get hurt, we get disappointed, we get wounded. And many times, even in charismatic environments, even asking a question can be frowned upon. And what we want to do is we want to make a safe environment where we can pursue God with all of our hearts. Say all. all. Say it again, all. all. We can pursue all of our, all, all, God with all of our hearts with confidence, knowing that God is a giver of good gifts and that he wants all of us to walk with a surety, not as slaves, but as friends, right? And understanding. And so there's a statement that I want to say in the very beginning, and it's this. We have to trust in God's ability to keep us more than in the enemy's ability to deceive us. I'm going to say it again. All of us together, I want you to understand this is very important for us. We have to, say have to. We have to get to a place where we trust God's ability to keep us more than the enemy's ability to deceive us. This, this life that we're living is not devil versus God and them being on equal playing fields. That's not what's going on right now. It's not big bad devil and big God, big good God, and they're fighting. This has already been determined. What we're doing now as a spiritual family is we're walking out that that has been determined, which will ultimately end in victory. But, but make no mistake, as we progress and as the world gets darker, which it will get darker, the world will continue to get darker, but in the midst of the darkness progressing, there will be a people, a remnant who will stand and who will experience more of God than we have ever experienced before. There will be things that we will see. There will be things we will partake of. And what I really want us to understand as a community and settle in our hearts is God's thoughts are not our thoughts and God's ways are not our ways. This is not an excuse for sloppy, charismatic Christianity. This is not an excuse for that. The, we have this scripture for a reason, and we want to have biblical understanding, and we want, we want to walk it out according to the word of God. Amen? Amen? We're not after manifestations. We're not after none of that. We want Jesus. Amen. But we also have to understand that God's ways are not our ways. And we have to acknowledge, and this is where I'll land on. I'll, I'll let Pastor Tyler do some of the heavy lifting. He's going to talk some, about some of the Bible and the, the history. But, but I want us to understand this that God will often, often offend us on the journey to see if we will remain yoked to him. And what has to be acknowledged for Gio, maybe not for you, but for Gio, what I have to acknowledge and confess to you is I have a need to want to control and to be comfortable. 
for all that we love as charismatic to say, God's doing a new thing. The moment that God starts doing something that I don't understand and that makes me uncomfortable, I resist it. And so we have to corporately start to ask the right questions to get the right answers. And the questions we have to ask is, what is God doing and how can I be in the midst of it? How can I now resist his leadership and how can I remain yoked to him? And I know in this room, I've been doing this since 2008 now. I came into a, a, an Assemblies of God church. All I really knew was seven day Adventists, which are amazing, but it, ha it had none of the same activity. So I remember walking into a room and going, what in the world is going on? Why is the guy with the Dr. Pepper shirt wanting to give me so many hugs? And why are they falling all over the place? Like this is a little extra. But, but what, I couldn't, what I couldn't reconcile was this, feeling that God was in the room. Seeing marriages be restored. Seeing hopeless people all of a sudden receive hope. Seeing addicts, including my life, be changed. So we want to journey for just a few moments here together and give understanding ahead of fire on the altar because I believe next weekend is going to be a significant weekend for our house. I don't even, listen, this isn't about numerical, how many people come or don't come. This is an opportunity that God has provided for us to engage with him in a unique way. And what we want to do is we want to remove any barriers. Amen. We want to remove any barriers between us and what God has for us so that we can encounter all of him. Amen. So I want to pray for our, for our hearts. And then I'm going to let Pastor Tyler dive into some of the stuff he wants to talk about. And then we're going to pray at the end. And what I want to pray for and what I want you to think about, right, as we journey, even as we pray, is what are the things that are causing you to reserve yourself to pull back or to resist God's leadership as you've been on the journey with God? What have been the hurts, the disappointments, even through church and experiences that have stopped you? And so I want to pray right now that God will begin to show us, because I believe he wants to liberate hearts this morning. Do you believe that? Yes. Three of you, good. Do you believe it? Yeah. So, Father, here we are. We open up our hearts to receive your word. We, we want you. You, Jesus, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you're what we're after. And so we're asking you to continue to cleanse your bride, to continue to help us, to love us back to life, to deliver us from any form of man-made religion, or routine or religiosity so that we can experience life in the spirit. We ask you to purify, to purify and cleanse your bride, that there would be no extra, that you would cleanse, purify God, and that we could have the real thing. In Jesus' name, all God's people said amen, amen. and amen. Pastor Tyler. Hey. So yeah, it's a little different this morning, but uh, we wanted to just have kind of like a family living, living room conversation. Um, I feel like not enough churches do this, or probably any churches do this, but it's really helpful because one of my goals for this morning, and I'll just kind of open it up, is, and this is uniquely maybe from my past and where I came from and where I'm going, is one of the major downfalls of the charismatic church as a whole is that we don't want to acknowledge or talk about sometimes things get weird. And then also, we don't want to ever bring, some, we never want to bring our minds and our intellect to the conversation. And there is a vein that is not healthy, I'll tell you right now, of anti-intellectualism anti in the charismatic church. And I'm just going to tell you, that's not God. And we actually can trace it back. In Azusa, when Azusa started happening, people started writing other branches of Christianity who were more intellectual, used their minds, all that sort of stuff. They wrote against it. And so what happened was the charismatic church that was birthing, and that they, they said, well, that's wrong, so we're not going to ever use our brains. We're just going to use our feelings. And anybody who brings up questions is now a heretic or they're religious or whatever. We are not that. And if you are that, please repent. Because in the scriptures, the Bereans, when Paul goes to them and preaches the gospel, the Bereans search the scriptures to see if what Paul is saying is true, and the Bible praises them. The Bible, they aren't viewed as religious, and it's interesting. So what I want to do is to take the move of God and use all of our faculties to worship him in spirit, mind, and strength, 
to use our mind to worship God. You can use your mind, charismatic, to worship God. Thank you. All right. Now, um, on the screen back there, I, I, I put it in the notes. We, this is a house built for him. For Gio and I and Marcus and the rest of our leadership team, that is more than just a fancy, cool saying. I really want God to have a house that is built for him. Part of the thing we need to understand is that only God builds the house. He says, I will build my house, my house. And so we can, so we build it with the Lord. We co-labor with him. In the Lord's house, he gets to set the rules. He gets to determine what is good, what is normal behavior, and what is not normal behavior. And I need all of us to understand whether you're on the realm of like, I've never been in a, like Gio, like never been in a charismatic service, or I grew up like me my whole life. We both come to the table with presuppositions, with pre ideas in our mind of what normal looks like and what I want us to do is I want us to yield those things before the Lord not check your mind at the door but I want us to say okay I may have things that are I'm bringing to the table I want to lay those down Lord you reveal to me what is truth you reveal to me what is truth because your mind my mind my will my emotions they will deceive me so that's where I want to go this morning um he will build his church now Let's just go ahead and get some of this stuff out of the way. The charismatic church can be weird. Can I get an amen from a charismatic who's been weird before? I've been weird. I've shaken on the ground. Just, just own it. You can be weird sometimes. You have some weird stuff you do. Um, it's interesting, though, the term weird. Weird or, or, you know, whatever means that it's, I'm not used to that. And it's, it's strange to me. But that word weird is relative, right? What's weird to me may not be weird to you. Let's say you're a Catholic and you've grown up in the Catholic church your whole life. If you walk into any church, even just a, a tame Baptist church or whatever, it's going to be weird to you. So then we have to ask, well, what, what line of weirdness becomes unhelpful? Does this make sense? Where does weirdness cross a boundary to where it's not just weirdness, now it's wrong? And there's a line there. And, but it may not be where you think it is. And so let me just say, for many of us, we are unfamiliar with the history of the church. And so when we see things... Um, and we're going to preface some stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take us on a journey real quick. And, and Gio, you just hop in anytime you want. But when we see things, oftentimes we think this is charismania. This is like charismatic craziness. This is, this is all the stuff I've seen on TV that I, I'm scared of. Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, all the stuff. I'm not th trying to throw shade. I'm just addressing the elephant in the room, okay, the 4,000-pound elephant. Is This is that. And in reality... Some of these things that we would call weird or wrong even have been happening through the scriptures. So we did a podcast. You can listen to the podcast. It's a little bit less filtered, and uh, we kind of go into it. It's funny. But let's just talk really quick about if we're going to talk about approved things that the Bible, even the Lord ordains that you are allowed to do in church. Let's talk about some of them. I got to do it. One of them is if you ever feel the Lord telling you to take off all of your clothes, all of them. Lay on the ground, on your side. Prophesy. And then when you're hungry, I have to say it, it's in the Bible. Use your own dung, your own feces to cook your food. That is an approved manifestation from the scriptures. Because Jeremiah did it. The Lord told Jeremiah to do this. If ever there's a moment where a man or a woman is pulled up by their hair, hoisted into the center of the, of the room like, like a horror film, and begins to prophesy. That is legal. That is okay. Because Ezekiel, happened to Ezekiel, lifted up between heaven and earth. So when we say, well, if that's weird, I agree. The Bible is weird. If you're ever talking to somebody, preaching to them, and all of a sudden you're translated across America, across the, the state, in a moment, the blink of an eye, literally transported, that is legal because it happened to Philip. 
when he, after he witnessed to the Ethiopian eunuch, he baptizes him after explaining the scroll of Isaiah. He's translated. So what are we talking about when we say that's weird? The Bible is weird. What I don't want us to do, and don't, please don't take this any shade, what I don't want us to do is to come to Christ and then want the new birth, the supernatural life, to be exactly like the old life, no supernatural stuff, no crazy stuff that kind of like rubs me the wrong way. What I don't want is to come to, come to Christ and now we just get to go to heaven at the end, which you don't even get to go to. You go to heaven for a brief moment, then you come back to earth. Another misconception. This is different. The supernatural life is meant to be different. Let me just take you through a couple brief uh, examples from the church history. Jonathan Edwards, amazing revivalist actually was a cessationist. If you know what that means, he believes that the gifts of the Spirit, tongues, prophecy, healing, they were not for today. They were, they were not possible. They were only with the apostles in the, early cent- or in the first century. Jon- Jonathan Edwards also would preach very monotone. In his meetings, it happened so much, he had to begin to wrestle with it. People would fall out and be in a trance on the ground. They, they were for hours, they would be unconscious. Jonathan Edwards, who didn't believe God moved that way, was perplexed. And it happened so often in his meetings. Even George Whitfield wrote against Jonathan Edwards, saying this is wrong until it began to happen in George Whitfield's meetings. Jonathan Edwards, in his memoirs, is wrestling with this. And he says, I, I, paraphrase, I didn't like it, but it began to happen so much. And the people who it began to happen to, I knew and loved. And then when they got up, they had a deeper affection for God. They had a deeper affection for God's word, hunger. They had a deeper affection for his people. Jonathan Edwards, a person who did not believe in signs, wonders, and miracles, began to say, I'm not going to judge the manifestation. I'm going to judge the fruit. And this is important for us. God will take you down a road of weirdness. Hopefully none of you cook food with your own poo. We, we cannot get wrapped up in why is the donkey talking? We have to say, what is he saying? What is the fruit of what is happening? Jonathan Edwards, okay, I got three more examples. Thomas Aquinas in the early, um, in, uh, in the 12th century said that he was taken into a vision. He was writing, Don, Tom, Thomas Aquinas, brilliant mind in the early church. He was writing his magnum opus of all the excellencies of Christ. He's taken into a vision of Christ, and he sees Christ in heaven. When he comes out of the vision, he was apparently there for like eight hours. He comes out, and he scraps and doesn't even complete his magnum opus because he says, from what I saw to what I was writing, what I was writing was straw compared to it. Irenaeus, who's in the second century, said that he had seen many dead raised, and he says, it is impossible It is not possible to name the number of gifts which Christ has scattered throughout the entire earth, has received from God in the name of Jesus Christ for the edification of the Gentiles. Last one. Charles Finney, amazing revivalist in the 1700s, said this. He says, when they were in a meeting, all the lights went out. There was no fire, no lanterns, obviously no electricity. And he says, but it was at nighttime, but the room was lit as if it was daytime. God has been doing weird stuff throughout history. So you say, do we just accept everything? By no means, to quote Paul. What do we do? I've, my personal opinion, and I'll throw it over to Pastor Gio, I want to follow Jonathan Edwards. I don't really care about the manifestation, what it looks like, what the person's doing, how they're yelling, how they're screaming, how they're rolling around, whatever's happening. Because I can't, the, the Bible itself has given me too much to judge weirdness. I want to judge what's happening after that person. Because a man cannot build a house that stands, Jesus says this, you cannot build a kingdom that, that goes against itself or it will crumble. So the devil is never going to give you the gift of loving God more. The devil is never going to give you the gift of loving the people. He's not, he's not that smart of like, I'm going to play a deep fake here. He's not going to do that. He's evil. And we'll get to this in a second, but Matthew 7 says, you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more does your Father in heaven know how to give good gifts to those who ask? 
So if you're asking for good things, and it, as leaders, this is, how we, this is how we're judging. So we actually think critically about services like last week. I'm not just thinking everything's great. I want to think critically. What I want to do is I want to judge the fruit. Wow. So I, I wanted to share for just a few moments on the book of Acts and us to understand that our paradigm of what church is. How many of you have a paradigm of church? That should be everybody. That means you have an idea of what church should be and church shouldn't be. But I just want to take us back to the beginning when God told a people to wait in an upper room. They did not know what they were waiting for. And then God comes into room and there's a sound like a mighty rushing wind. How many of you remember this story? Acts 2. God comes and he baptizes them with the Holy Spirit, which he promised them in the upper room, right? He said, I'm promising you the gift of the Holy Spirit. They're waiting. The Holy Spirit comes. But I want you to see that in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit comes, there are some emotions that come up in response to what God was doing. Not in response to the devil, not in response to witchcraft, in response to God's activity, what, what happens? It says this, they were bewildered to hear. They were completely amazed. They were perplexed. They laughed and they ridiculed. <laughs> it was like a plethora of emotions and obviously something that God was doing, yet the conclusion was they're all drunk. I don't know what was happening in the room. And again, I never want to use this as an excuse for sloppy Christianity. Listen, if you're in the room and you think you're more spiritual because you got some kind of activity going on, you're not. This isn't like the, yeah, stop it. Like the people who are loudest, it's not the, the more louder, the more spiritual. But there's also a recognition that when God meets us, there is something that happens to us. It's, it's not resisting God because a few people decided to get in the flesh. People ask me, well, how do you know, brother, if something's in the flesh or in the spirit? I don't. I can't look at somebody and say, that's the devil, or that, like, there is a gift of discerning spirits, right? But in a room this size, I'm not going to spend an hour of worship when I'm supposed to have eyes on Jesus trying to assess what everybody's doing in the room. We've got to trust the leadership of the Holy Spirit where Jesus says, I am the vine dresser, and he prunes, right, that he will come and he will take care of that which is flesh, and that no flesh will glory in his presence, and so we've got to begin to ask, man, when we come into these rooms and, and, and recognize there will be all kinds of responses, but we're not going to give ourselves an offense to the responses because our job is as a family, we all want to go say all. all. We all want to go to what God has. And what God has for me is not the same as what God has for you. Yeah. And what God has for you is not the same as what God has for me. Yeah. But the big deception is that we stop reaching for God because we see a few people operating in some things that are not of God. And we've all been there. Listen, we've all had people. How many of you know you can have no confidence in the flesh? Meaning at some point or another, even the best man is going to let you down. Even the most put together, well, responsible, blah, 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 is going to fail you. So our trust can only be in God. And we have to stay yoked to him. But I want us to understand that when God moves, it is going to be beyond our comfortability. Yeah. Our conception of church, I, I, I was sharing in the podcast, and I hope that you all listen to it, where literally our way of doing church today in America is this here on Sunday mornings is the showroom. Yeah. And when God wants to move, we got to take it into a back room because like when you walk into a dealership, the showroom is not where you do oil, oil changes. And this is the mentality of the church. This is real. If God's going to move, let's take it into a small group or into a back room. And the primary reason why is because it's going to make people uncomfortable. So listen, if we're really building God a house, let me tell you something. I own a house. In my house, I have a kitchen table. But if I want to eat the, my dinner in my living room, you're not going to tell me where I'm going to eat dinner. Because it's my house. So if somebody goes into your house and starts telling you what to do in your house, you're like, bro, this is my house. Yeah. And if we're really going to build God a house, what we can't do is begin to tell God what he can't and what he can do based off of our preferences. Why? Because it's God's house. And it was actually purchased. How many of you know we were purchased with a price? It wasn't free. It was a high price for us to live in freedom and not in bondage. And what I want you to understand today and why we're doing baptisms on Sunday is some of you, you are not going to be able to step into the new season with an old mindset. You will be in the struggle bus. You'll be driving that thing. 
thinking that you're going to step in the new thing God has for you, but you're going to operate with the same old mindset. Read your Bible and, and look at what happened to people over 40 years in the book of Exodus that wanted to step into something new with an old way of thinking. God resisted them. He was with them, but they never went into the promise. Think about that. That God in this season where he is shifting us, he is leading us forward that we would not become offended with God's leadership, with God's ways of moving. What, and we tell him, this is what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. I don't know why God chose to speak to Moses in a burning bush. He could have done it anyway. It could have been an inner voice. He could have shown up as an angel, but he chose to do it in a burning bush. I don't know why God chose to, 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 to call John up in Revelation and then he falls as a dead man. What I'm trying to say is our clean form and fashion of Christianity is way far gone beyond the biblical narrative. And if we want to have all of God, I'm just saying let's have all of God. I'm not saying let's open ourselves up and saying the crazier the better. I'm just saying that I, I know this. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit can be quenched and the Holy Spirit can be grieved. I'm going to say it. You don't believe biblically, look it up. The Holy Spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, do not quench. That would be like putting out a fire. Like there's a fire and you put a blanket, a wet blanket over it. Don't quench the spirit. Don't grieve the spirit. This isn't just a corporate mandate, although it is. It's an individual mandate. You need to know there are things in your life that you can give yourself to that will put out the fire of God in you. Are you alive? I feel like today is a preparatory for where God is taking us. Some of you are like, I don't know why we're talking about this. You'll remember six months down the road when you feel like, man, why am I stuck? Because we took a day like this to give language and understanding. We're, we're, we're actually, at, we're, at, we're begging, please, anything in your life that is quenching the Holy Spirit, including religious ideologies. Our job in this room is not to assess the room. It's not. I don't know when. The, look in your Bible. Your job is not to come and to assess the hotness or the coldness of the room. Your job is to engage with God. It's God's house. It's God's way. And it's only His way. Now, there are things we can do, right? We can put together programs. We can throw money at things. And we could have activity. But it doesn't mean it's God. If filling buildings and filling places were God, AMC and Disney World will be having revival right now. But what makes the church unique is God is in control. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. So when Tyler is talking about people manifesting, whether they're laughing or they're crying or they're falling or they're shaking or whatever, what I'm going to ask is, what's going on 12 weeks from now? Like, how do I know if it's God or not? I want to talk to that person three months from now. Are they loving their wife better? Are they walking in righteousness? Is the fruit of the spirit, because listen, anybody can prophesy and be living in sin. The giftings and callings of God are without repentance. So God's going to move. That's why we can't judge it by activity. Well, brother, he's laying hands on the sick. That has nothing to do with him. But what I know is fruit, love, patience, kindness, gentleness. These are the things that those manifestations should be producing. So if you're not more gentle or kind or patient, stop it. Yeah, stop on, it. On that, on that note, just real, real briefly, pastorally. Like, I want to say this as a pastor, as a leader in this house. If you are one of those people, and I have nobody in mind, so don't even think that. But you're, you, you manifest, you prophesy, and you are living in sin. It doesn't, and, and manifesting and prophesying doesn't make you more spiritual or whatever. But, I mean, this should be everybody. I want to just say, stop. Repent. Turn. Like, there is nothing shiny about prophesying that all of a sudden gets to wipe over your sin another once again this is another mark against the charismatic church we will turn a blind eye to sin because someone is anointed stop it it's it's profane fire and god will purify his church before the end of the age i wanted to say really briefly i'll kick it back over to geo um so maybe you're asking yourself well does that mean just anything is possible we're going to do anything and you know, maybe you're asking well i remember in first corinthians i have it pulled up here in first corinthians 14 it says let all things be done decently and in order 
So to answer your first question, I, no, I mean, there is a line here. If you do get naked, I probably will escort you out. Like, I mean, I don't know. It's fine for Jeremiah. It's not fine for you, okay? It's just not going to be okay. Um, <laughs> but let all things be done decently and in order. You, read the passage. Read early church context. What do we mean by decently and in order? This is a house church with 15 people in it, Paul's writing to. This is, in, in the way the church operated in the, those 15 people was you had elders who oversaw, but everybody, when they came, they all shared. That's why it says, hey, let no more than two or three give a tongue with interpretation. No more two or three to give a prophecy. They were all sharing in a circle. Well, that looks, I mean, what well, does kind of look like a little bit of a circle here, but, um, you know, we don't do that. We don't pass the mic around, so maybe we're not in order. Maybe almost every single church in America today is not doing things decently and in order. So then we have to ask ourselves, what is Paul saying? It seems clear to me that Paul's saying, do things that edify the body. Because he's giving the whole chapter of 14 talking about how things, you, you can do things in a service that will actually hurt the edification of the body. And there's a better way to do things. So think, do things decently and in order. So we want to do things that edify the body. One of the things we have to understand or wrestle with is that people are on different stages of their journey. I want to dismantle this too. If you're not used to some of this stuff and it does rub you the wrong way, it's okay. There is grace for you. You're not less than. I don't even think you have a religious spirit. It's just new to you. There's nothing wrong with that. And if you've been in here and you think that people who are prophesy or speak in tongues or roll on the ground are more spiritual or you didn't get touched by God unless you do that, that's also a false mindset. I want to normalize just people being normal in Christ. And we, we can allow for the manifestation. And I love this. Last thing I'll say. I keep saying that. Um, <laughs> you can't judge a person's outward, when, when we say manifestation, I, I, we often use Christian lingo. It means what a person is outwardly doing when it seems as if God is moving on them, okay? That's, what, you know, whether it's crying, laughing, rolling around, whatever, shaking. Um, you can't judge it in the moment. And I think it's the divine providence of the Lord that he does this because he wants us to stay in family. Yeah. You have to stay in the conversation long enough because it would be, it, it's the Lord's way. He doesn't want us to judge it immediately and then walk away or say, well, that's, I just feel this, so no. He says, you're going to see that, and you're going to have to stay in it long enough to see the fruit. And what happens is, as you stay in long enough, you get close to people. And that person who's rolling around on the floor that you seem as weird, and like, there's just no way that's not demonic, you start to know them. And you start to see that God set them free from, from, from an eating disorder. And now they feel the freedom of God, and they just feel the love of God, and it manifests in their body. And when they're doing that, they are just feeling God's love. But you won't know that if you don't stay in the conversation, if you don't get close to the things that offend you. And to see that, man, I, I had this happen once where this, a person did this, and they had a person who offended them with the way they worship. And I encouraged them to get close. They got close, and they realized that God had delivered them from all this sort of stuff. Now, when that person worships the way they do, the person actually gets emotional because they see proximity equals intimacy, and it breaks down the barriers of offense. And it's God's way to keep us in the conversation with people. And it's interesting to me, you know, we, some of the things that bother us, if, if we went to a Buccaneers game right now at 1 o'clock and there was a 1,000 people with their shirts off screaming, we wouldn't be like, that's much. And I'm not asking for people in the church to take their shirts off and scream. I'm just saying some of the paradigms that we have of, but what's interesting is we would have no problem walking to a church. We would have more issue with people being laughing with joy than being sad and depressed. And there's just something wrong there that we would be offended by laughter, but be okay with depression without understanding that sometimes that's the key. And so I, I want you, I, I want to cut, cut, will you come up? I want you to just hear a brief a brief testimony, because I think it's important that you don't just hear from pastors and it feel like we're giving a defense because we're really not. This isn't a defense thing, but I, did you almost just trip bro, in front of everybody? All 400 people. That's to humble you. 
But, but I want you to hear, sometimes when God is moving, you don't always get to hear or understand what God is doing. But for you to understand that it's not just about tears or crying, actually God is doing a deep interior work. And we could probably take the next two hours with those of you who were in this room last week and share. But just for a brief moment to hear, like a little bit of what God did in Cub. This was just me and him at Target yesterday. He was just sharing what God was doing. And I want you to hear so you can understand that what, what God is doing goes beyond just emotional stuff. It's a deep inner heart work. Amen? Yes. Uh, so um, I guess I would say th this year has probably been the, the hardest year of my life. Um, just with transitions and me really figuring out like, who I am and my identity in the Lord. I spent a lot of the year like actively resisting the Lord as I tried to like fulfill myself with other things. You know, not like outright sin, but finding purpose and doing and being. And it just got hard. And um, like I really just kind of tossed the Lord to the side and tossed a lot of people to the side in the process of just trying to be loved in all the wrong ways. And um, <clears throat> so, like, as we got ready to go into this fast, you know, I've been writing in my journal and just reconnecting with the Lord in a deeper way. And I've just had this fear um, of if, if I, like, if I go back, if I surrender to him, like, are you going to show up? Like, or am I going to, like, I, I equate it to, like, standing on the cliff and knowing you have to jump and wondering whether or not you're going to smash your head, like, on the cliffs below or if he's, like, going to catch you and you're going to fly. And so I had been writing in my journal as I had been kind of trying, like, it's been in, like, the last few weeks um, trying to figure out, like, if this is something I'm, I'm going to do or not, you know, and writing to the Lord and, because I find it easier to write letters to the Lord as my prayers and because I have ADHD and I, I don't focus well. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm writing these letters to the Lord. And I'm like, Lord, I just don't know. Like, if I do this, I just don't know if you're going to show up. I just don't know if you're going to show up. I'm scared. And I told Gio, I was like, I'm scared. I'm going to do the fast. I'm going to submit, but I'm scared. And um, I, I want to say, like, bef like, maybe the first week of the fast, I was writing in my journal. And um, I heard the Lord say, um, that you are as loved as you have ever been and ever will be. And I just wrote that in my, uh, in my journal. And I just kind of, and I also going through like a really tough month, just tough. And uh, so trying to navigate that and like trying to, and surrendering at the same time, I came to church last week and honestly, I just wasn't, I wasn't feeling it. Um, life got, has gotten really hard over the last month and I'm here. Um, but that was about, that's about, that's about all I could, uh, muster. And so I was outside and I was talking to Kenny during worship and really I was resisting the Lord. Um, cause I was like, I'm not, even, I'm, I'm going to use talking to Kenny as an excuse to not come in here and be a part of the worship set. I'm just going to, you know, that's what I was doing. And I came in right towards the end and, um, still, still afraid and, as Marcus came up to like end the service and started talking about it being a holy moment and, and, uh, and, th and things like that, I'm sitting in my seat and I, I kind of scoffed like, ah, you know, whatever, it's nothing's going to happen. This, this isn't for me. And, um, I had, I was, I was already trying to resist the Lord and like what he was doing. It was, and, uh, at one point as you said, uh, to everybody just start praying out loud. And I was like, nah, I'm not doing it. <laughs> and, um, I don't know what, I just being rebellious, you know what I mean? Like, I just wrote it in the journal like two days ago, but I was so scared, I was like willing to, to not take that chance. Well, anyway, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to do it, and um, I'm just going to get on my face. Like, I'm not going to make any more decisions. I'm just going to get on my face, and even if it's just one word, I'm just going to say one word and, and, and then let whatever happen, happens. Now, obviously, you know, after I, lay, I laid down and I just submitted to the Lord, and like immediately, um, immediately it was just like love poured over me, mm -hmm. and it was just un. I I couldn't, I couldn't do anything but cry. I was just, it was it was amazing uh, to be honest with you. 
And um, I'm just learning that, like, my weakness is okay. And, um, and I'm weak, bro. <laughs> like, especially right now, I'm weak. Um, I, and he actually prefers it. He doesn't prefer my strength and, and my action. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, it's just been amazing to be, to be weak and to be loved. Yeah. That's his mic. Thank you, bro. You know, I've, that's just one small story of, of, I mean, we heard him on the live stream. We were watching with our phones, and we heard this whale. We're like, there's Cove. But sometimes because we've been in environments where it's been abuse and it's been disorder, we hear stuff like that, and they're like, here we go. There's just madness going on without understanding that. He came into a service feeling not seen by God and wondering, if I open up my heart, will you really meet me there? And all of a sudden, he is found with love. Now, if, if church isn't for that, I don't know what it's for. Because where God is taking us, it, it's going to have to be more than just our head. Right? Like, we want our head. I still agree with Pastor that we've got to be able to give answers to the questions. But there are certain places that only your heart can take you. John 6 proves this. When Jesus stands up on the mountain and he's fed the multitudes and then he goes into like the whole cannibal speech, right? Like he's feeding the multitudes and many are there. Then he's like, you got to drink my blood and eat my flesh. And people start walking away. You would walk away too. You're like, yo, the Jesus guy's talking about eating flesh and drinking blood now. I got a little weird. It's disorderly. But there was something about Peter's heart that knew I've got to stay in the conversation. Because I have proximity, and I know that even though I don't understand, I understand. So he made a declaration. Where else would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. I've got to stay tethered to you, even though you're leading me somewhere I don't understand. What I want to say to you is this is the way God is going to lead us. As we move forward, he will weaken our strength where the world will see it actually has nothing to do with us and everything to do with him. And we will have to remain soft, tender, and responsive to him on the journey. And I'm not saying that you're gonna understand all of it, but what I'm gonna say is you will have a sense of it was God. Yes. It was God. Make no mistake, it was God. And I think the biggest obstacle we're gonna have to overcome is becoming offended with our brother on the journey without understanding what he's going through. Yeah. Let's remove Covington. Let's say it's anybody else in the room that's wailing and you feel uncomfortable or bothered, but you don't understand that his life is in disarray and it's been the hardest year of his life and he's never been where he is right now, yet in this moment, God is on him. Yeah. And he doesn't know what else to do but cry because the fear was, if I open up my heart, I don't know if you'll come and you came. Yeah. Is there a wrong response to that? And these are the things, and, I, and I'm, I'm not saying all of it's God, but what I'm saying is we've got to make room for that. Because on the other side of trying to control everything is we miss those moments. Those moments get stifled, quenched, and we grieve the Holy Spirit. Because the only reason we're here is for those moments to happen. It's the only reason we engage, is to create a space for God to touch his people, and we walk this thing out together. Amen? Does that make sense? So I want to say to us, God wants to break our boxes. How many of you have boxes? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just everybody. We all have boxes and preferences and ideas. And God is shattering boxes. And he's leading us to better places. And the question we have to settle, every single one of you, I'm not asking you to trust Gio. I'm asking you to trust the Lord. Our, our trust is not in Gio or in Tyler or in Marcus or in anybody here. Your trust is in the Lord. And I'm asking you to put your confidence in him and to journey with him to places we've never been. Because make no mistake, mark my words, revival is coming. God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And it will not look the way you thought it's going to look. Revival is not more meetings with more people. Revival is God bringing dead things back to life, and those dead things are messy. They're broken, they're messy. It doesn't get a lot of claps. I don't know why else we're here. Why else are we gathering, if not because we believe that God's gonna pour out his spirit and he's gonna change all of Tampa, Florida. Why else are we gathering? 
and understanding that he's not going to do this with us planning on a whiteboard. There are going to be, this is why I feel like this Sunday is so important. There will be more of last Sundays in the future. We're praying for it and we're asking God for it. That he would lead us into places where it's not about a man with a message. It's about God. And God is asking, are you willing to surrender and yield and trust that my leadership is better than yours? I need you to understand that's what we're wrestling with as leaders. When God comes into a room, he's asking us, do you want to do your thing or you want to do my thing? You say, can both simultaneously happen? Maybe. But I know I'd rather err on the side of God. You can have whatever you want. We'll stay still. We'll yield. We'll sing a little bit longer. We'll be still. We'll be quiet. We'll let the crying happen. We'll let people laugh. And we'll assess on the other side. And we will judge by the fruit. So here's my disclaimer. If you fall on the ground and you're shaking and you're making a show, there is an expectation by the leadership that it will show in fruit. Your wife should see you loving her better. You should be more patient. Your children should get yelled at less. If you're going to fall on the ground and shake, there should be a divine manifestation the next Monday in your life. You should be an example in your job. You should be slow to speak, slow to anger. This is what should be seen. Because listen, what happened four years ago, right? What's coming up again in the political season, we need people who are actually walking in the spirit. Dr. Michael Brown wrote a letter. He says, what is God saying in 2024? The number one thing Dr. Michael Brown said on his letter to the church is don't trust the prophets. Think about how crazy that is. Yet God has told us that he has given us prophets as a gift to the church. But the enemy has perverted it. But this is all a part of the divine washing. God is washing his church and he's shifting us He's breaking boxes and he's leading us, but I want you to trust that it's him. I want to beckon you to allow him to wash you of the unbelief and all of the things you've seen. I want to acknowledge that you probably have seen some crap. There probably has been mixture in the past where you've been, but I want us to trust in God's ability to cleanse us and lead us so that we can walk in the fullness of the Spirit and not be halfway in and halfway out. The enemy creates no new thing. He does not have the ability to create. Therefore, he perverts. Which means this. There are God things that the enemy perverts. And we can't resist God things because of perversion. We have to ask God to bring it back to light, to cleanse it and walk it out in fullness and in spirit and in purity again. Amen? You want to say anything else? Yeah, I wanted to just uh, root us in uh, Matthew as, 7. Kind of like any, yeah, Matthew 7, also Luke 11. Um, Jesus is talking. He's like, he's giving, I, I mentioned it earlier. You who, sinful people who know how to give good gifts to your children. If they ask for bread. Would you give them a rock? You know, if you know how to give good gifts, he's saying this. He says, will not the Father give the Holy Spirit to him who asks? So you have to ask yourself, because there's a lot of stuff going on in the world today, a lot of chatter in the Christian space today about, oh, if you do this, it's the, it's the kundalini spirit. It's the blah, blah, blah spirit. I'm sorry. My Bible says if I, if I in a pure heart like Cove asks, would you touch me, Jesus? Jesus will not give me a snake. Come on. And I'm sorry that people have exegeted the scripture, eisegeted the scripture actually wrongly. But that... But the scripture is the scripture. And he says, if you ask with a pure heart, yeah. Lord, because that is not a talking about getting cars and houses. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Anything you ask, you'll be given to you, please. It's asking, Lord, would you touch me again? He will not give you a stone. He will not give you a snake. We have, we talked about this in the podcast briefly. And, and I'll ground us here is we have to trust God's ability to keep us from deception. That in this, as you're journeying out into the great ocean that is life with God, He is your only life raft. Yeah. He is the life raft. And part of this is we have to get to a place where we really actually trust God. Yeah. 
I have done this in my life, I feel oftentimes it is my job to keep me out of deception. It is my job to, to keep myself in the lines. And yes, I need to try to, to be a good Berean, but I can do no good thing. I have to every day abide in the vine. That's right. Trust he is doing it. He is keeping me. He is leading me. And sometimes it's going to look like weirdness. On, in Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the, or, sorry, you lead me in paths of righteousness. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes he will lead you into places that are scary, even though it's on the path of righteousness. But it's all centered. This whole conversation is centered in, Lord, we trust you. God, I trust you. And I trust that you will show me what is a stone, what is a snake, and I, pr and I trust you that you will lead me into paths of righteousness for your name's sake. So I want to pray this morning for those that you've lost your ability to trust the Lord. When we were first got saved, um, I've shared this multiple times, but I got saved, got hired onto that church. We fell into a difficult season, and the church accused us of some things that just were not true. And I remember being angry at God and God saying, I didn't do that. They did that. That has nothing to do with me. So why lose trust in me because of something they did? And I really feel like the Lord wants to restore trust. I'm sorry that those people did that, and they said that, and they said it was God, and they were of another spirit. But let's not allow that to allow our hearts to grow dull and cold towards the Lord. The Lord is good. And he's kind. And he set us in this moment ahead of whatever he has for us next week and beyond to be able to trust him with all of our hearts. As Tyler said, this really is all about trust. It should be a tail sign for us if we've been journeying with God and we've lost hope in man and it causes us to disengage with God. Has our trust been in God or in man? We just have to ask the question. Because God will actually strip us of every other thing until it's only him. Because he's our only, he is our only hope, as Tyler said. So I want to pray this morning, and I really, I told Tyler, I was like, I really want to be gentle, and I want to invite those who have felt on the outside, and have felt hurt and jaded, and even done wrong by church, that God would bring healing to that place. So can we just close our eyes? I just want to take a moment to respond to the Lord. I know this was a different Sunday, but... I just feel like it's so important that we shepherd our hearts amidst what God is doing. Amen. So, Father, we, we ask you in this moment for grace. Many of us have been in different walks of life and we've seen things, we've heard things, we've experienced things that have been painful. It's been discouraging, it's been disappointing. It's caused us to lose hope. And you made it clear that when hope is deferred, it makes our hearts sick. And we're asking you this morning to bring healing to our heart. To give us grace to hope again, to trust again. Not in man, not in some religious institution, or in things or activity, but in you. To be able to plant our heart firmly trusting you. So, Father, this morning, we want to acknowledge the pain, and we want to ask you to heal us. For those of us that have gone other ways or have closed our hearts because of experiences or even leaders that have hurt us, I want to pray for healing. I felt like even people in the room that have been hurt by leaders in the body of Christ or in the church that have just misrepresented God, and it's caused you to just close off. I feel like this morning the Lord's like, would you just open up your heart? Just like Cove, would you just open up your heart one more time? Father, we thank you that your word says that if we ask for bread, you will not give us stone. So here we are asking you for bread, for life. 
for passion, for vibrancy to be able to love you with all of our hearts. And you will not leave us as orphans. You will not leave us alone. This morning, we want to pray for any in the room that that's been you. You've been hurt. You've been hurt by church. You've been hurt by people. And we actually want to pray for you. So if that's you, if you've experienced that, it's, would you just lift up a hand across the room? We want to pray. There's some here. Just, just high. We want to actually cover you in pray. And just ask the Lord to just, to just bring healing right now. Can I get some of my shepherds to just move around? We're going to pray for you now. Nothing weird. We just want to ask the Lord to bring healing. Just, just a little bit of trust again. Father, we choose to forgive. And we recognize that you are not that. And you love us and you lead us. And we, we choose even now to release those people of judgment and we choose to, to open up our hearts again to your spirit, to your presence. God, we, we ask that there would be no hindrance on the inside that would stop us from engaging with you. Even now, there's a few in the back. Can we just get some people back there? I just want everybody prayed with. I just feel like it's important. We speak over you that you are not alone, that God has not forgotten you, and that God's plans and purposes for your life are alive. Father, I ask you to remove every word that was spoken over them, every negative thing that was put on them from a place of, of pain, from a place of, of brokenness. God, we ask right now that you would speak over them, that you would heal their minds, that you would heal their hearts, that you would heal their spirits. We thank you, God, that every word you spoke over them is alive, that God's not done with you, that his plans and purposes over you are alive and that bread is coming. God, we ask for hope, hope to arise in every heart. Even now, would you lift off the weight of every heart, of every person that has been hurt? Holy Spirit, would you come now and make our heart tender. I just feel like the Lord, like you don't have to keep those walls up with me anymore. We can re-engage in the conversation. God, even now we pray that you would awaken desire for fresh relationship, like a fresh start. God, I pray for every person in this room. I pray that you would shatter our boxes that we have put you in, God. We pray, would you keep us from the evil one? Keep us from all temptation. Keep us from any striving, God. We ask that you would take off of your church any sense of needing to perform, to be more spiritual or to be seen, but that we would pursue you with purity of heart, with all of our heart, God, that you are marrying the word and the spirit and truth and we ask God right now in Jesus' name, would you lead us and guide us and shepherd us into what you are doing? That there would be no reservation in trusting you. You have access to our families and our homes and our devotional lives and our, and, and our workplaces, God. We give you access to every place. And we ask you to shatter the boxes and the mindsets and the stumbling blocks and the religion that has been put on us. Would you just ask him? Just you, God, God, break every box. Break every box in your church. Yeah, I just wanna pray right now for um, the prophetic, um, just the manipulation that maybe has come from prophetic voices over your lives, even things that uh, maybe a leader had spoken over you, but it was actually control, and, it, and they used the prophetic to control you. And so I just wanna, I wanna come against that right now. Father, we just come
come against every voice that spoke on behalf of you, but that was not actually from you. Lord, everything that was used to control when we were supposed to go, when we heard the voice that said, don't go, Father, every area that was in error, Lord, we just submit that to you. And we're sorry that we came in agreement with it because we did not know it was manipulation on our, on our behalf. So Lord, we just ask, would you just gently remove every word that we've come into agreement with that was not actually your voice? Every bit of manipulation and control, Father, would you just tear down that right now, Lord? And Father, on behalf of the prophetic voices, we are sorry that we have misspoken from you. We are sorry that we were using manipulation to control your people. Lord, would you forgive us for misspeaking, for misgiving words, for personal gain, Lord? Father, would you forgive us for trying to control your people? And we called it prophecy. Lord, would you give us your fear? Would there be a holy fear that would come upon our words that we would not misspeak on behalf of God? That we would not misspeak on your behalf, Father, but every word that proceeds from our mouths, let it be held in fear of that. It would be up to you, Lord, that it would be your words, not our words. Father, we thank you for giving us ears to hear your voice. And we want to be obedient to say what only you're saying, Lord. And speak what only you're speaking. Father, we thank you that we can trust you. And that you are a good shepherd. Father, forgive us for putting more trust in prophetic words than we are putting trust in you. Yeah, I just even sense maybe someone, maybe a prophet or someone who claimed to be gave you a prophetic word and you've been putting so much hope in the prophetic word, but it actually wasn't even a word from the Lord. And now because it wasn't a, a word from the Lord, you think that all of the prophetic is perverted and wrong. Because you've been desiring this word to come forth and the Lord's saying, I never spoke that word over you. Father, would you remove that word from us? Father, you did not misspeak and you can be trusted. 